Hello everyone, this is the Institute of Austrian Economics and I'm Mithun Datta. Today we are going to discuss introduction to financial markets using the Austrian econ economics approach. I have uh, Shashank, Shivang, Shikhar with me and uh, this session today is going to be pretty basic. It's just going to give you an overview of what financial markets are, how people, how, how people work with the financial markets, how they manage their investments, how they you know determine various prices, how they analyze the market uh, from I mean mostly from the uh, mainstream point of view and then I'm going to you know talk about a little bit about uh, how the Austrian economics uh, economists uh, deal with the, the financial market and how it differs from the mainstream analysis of uh, financial markets. So basically, if uh, when we are talking about financial markets, uh, it's it's basically we are talking about markets, right? So market is a mean or a place where goods are and services are exchanges exchanged between uh, buyers and sellers, right? And also there are contracts between buyers and sellers. So even these contracts are financial instruments which are traded in markets so markets in a literal sense are you know are places where these goods will be sold and bought uh, <clears throat> now investment uh, investment is a you know uh, uh, we is, is, a, is a process which uh, by which we you know uh, invest i mean we transform our capital goods into into consumer goods kind of thing that's one kind of investment or an investment in economics would be like uh, when we finance something we put our money into certain assets and we tend to look at a profit uh, we expect a profit out of it so that's basically an investment investment can take place uh, when you have savings I and mean, people will have savings uh, an investor may not uh, use his own saving he might uh, borrow savings from some some other institution and invest in the market so basically investment is uh, you know uh, putting money or finance into buying of resources or products with an intention of making profit in the future so that's the basic fundamental of uh, investment and uh, investments actually take place in different uh, marketplaces where you can have an investment or you can simply buy uh, those things for consumption are uh, different type of markets uh, marketplaces where you know we actually go out and buy stuff that uh, that will be retail markets and wholesale markets which is uh, you know which will sell you commodities and different products you have fairs and exhibitions trade exhibitions or you know consumer exhibitions where you can go in and purchase your stuff. So there are auction markets. Auction markets uh, take place in uh, exchanges as well as uh, in uh, in different. Uh, it might take place in a wholesale market as well. It it might take place in a fair or an exhibition as as well. Auction markets are basically where you have the item on display and uh, uh, people are going to bid on it, and the highest bidder is most likely to get that uh, particular product. Uh, mostly antiques and uh, you know precious goods, rare goods are sold using the auction markets. Uh, rest of the things, uh, rest of the goods like consumer goods or you know goods and products which are commonly used will be sold using a call market. Uh, call market is basically where the seller is going to you know come up with a price and he is going to offer that product in that particular price and thereafter, depending on the trading, the price will keep on changing on the market. The labor market is the employment market where you know services uh, uh, job market where you have job exchanges employee exchanges uh, this is this is where you, you put in like uh, the employee seekers are employment seekers are going to put in their resume or the, their applications for jobs and the employers will be putting in their requirements uh, in the labor market and you also have people who will be offering services for example lawyers or doctors who will be you know 
are part of uh, labor market, uh, stock brokers, stock analysts, marketing people, uh, anyone who is offering their services will be a part of the labor market. Uh, telemarkets and online markets are basically, uh, they don't have a physical location as such. I mean, a physical market where they are displaying goods and stuff. Uh, they might be, you know, directly shipping stuff from their factories or from their go-downs or warehouses. Uh, telemarketing, uh, where you you may have uh, marketing offers uh, on via radio or via uh, on on the television. You have uh, tele telemarketing shows and online markets like eBay, Amazon, where you you buy products from there. Uh, these are online shops. They do not have a physical shop in the market. And rest are the financial markets. Financial markets are where you're going to create uh, the futures, options, uh, com company stocks, uh, uh, bonds, insurances, mutual funds, and stuff like that. So these are different marketplaces which uh, we work with. Uh, there is a concept called as liquidity in the markets which uh, the assets which are going to take uh, you know get exchanged are liquid assets liquidity is a business term where you know uh, it's it's a facility or it's a property of an asset where it can be quickly sold in the market uh, the most liquid asset is money or cash where you know everyone is willing to take uh, uh, buy that asset or use that asset uh, to exchange for other goods and you don't have to wait or liquidate your asset. Liquidating your asset means uh, you might have uh, machinery or land or something, some some goods which uh, you cannot really exchange. You may have to, like uh, in barter system, we know like uh, we had this liquidity problem where you cannot trade uh, certain goods uh, easily. You have to exchange it for an intermediate good and then which which emerges as money later on and then then you can trade it with uh, for the goods that you want. Uh, metals like gold are again money. I mean, we term it at money. It's also a liquid asset. Uh, if you have metal in a in a shape of a machinery or something, then uh, you have to scrap it. The metal will be melt into sheets or rods or you know bars and then sold in the market. So that's uh, I mean the machineries are not uh, easy to be sold. So that's a, that's a problem. So you have to liquidate it. And then you can sell it. So that that might be a period, a, a time which is going to take. Uh, you know, there will be uh, which which will be required to liquidate your asset. Uh, and then you can have your house or real estate, which uh, you know is not a liquid asset. You just simply cannot sell it. Uh, you have to go through a long process of negotiations. There might be big projects where you know uh, you want to. Uh, it might not be finished and you want to get out of that uh, project and you want to sell that project to someone else so that that's a non liquid asset so liquidity is uh, when we are dealing with uh, investment and trading we are mostly uh, going to use uh, liquid assets like money or cash to buy liquid goods liquid assets which are like commodities or you know finished goods which are available in the market <clears throat> A financial market. What what is a financial market? Financial market is uh, uh, unlike the retail or the wholesale market where you're going to buy commodities. Uh, in a financial market, uh, also we trade in securities and commodities, but uh, mostly in uh, in uh, in terms of contracts and uh, uh, rarely on deliveries. So, in, in a financial market, you're going to buy or trade financial instruments like. Uh, uh, stocks or commodity contracts and other uh, goods or like bonds or mutual funds and or agricultural goods contract of agricultural goods this is what is going to be traded in a financial market uh, a financial market uh, will I mean the marketplace actually they what they do is they charge a, because they are providing a market they will they will always have some kind of uh, operational charges and a profit in incentive so they will charge you brokerage or service charges for providing their, their services so there are different types of financial markets uh, for example uh, we have the stock market where equities are being sold we have a uh, bond market where insurance bonds or debt bonds are being sold bonds are basically debts 
uh, commodity market where we trade agricultural, non-agricultural commodities, commodities like gold, silver, copper, zinc, which are metal. And uh, we will have uh, agricultural goods like uh, rice, wheat, potatoes, tomatoes, orange juice. We can have meat, ca uh, cattle. Uh, those uh, those will be sold in commodity markets. And we have energy like uh, uranium. Uh, we have uh, crude oil, natural gas, which are going to be sold on um, the commodity market. Uh, money markets are debts and finance markets where you know if uh, you're going for a bank to uh, I mean these are these are markets which are going to provide you venture capital investments or you know uh, if you require a loan for your project so this is the market where you're going to go where you're looking for financing and investment crowdsourcing is one example of a money market where you're going to put your project and people are going to invest on it Derivatives market is uh, basically it's a part of the stock as well as the commodity market. Derivatives are are instruments where you know uh, you hedge or you try to minimize your risk. So there are certain contracts which we will look uh, ahead in the lecture. Uh, futures market is uh, contracts where you have a forwards contract or a future contracts where you know you're going to trade for the future goods like uh, if you want to. Uh, to if you're getting into production, you want to have some kind of assurances where there, you will look for uh, buyers in the future who who are ready or who will agree to buy those products in in a future date on a future date at a fixed as, at a future price. So that's the future market where these contracts are being traded. Insurance insurance companies like people are going to trade their insurance. Uh, uh, I mean, uh, if there is a insurance contract where they are they are. Uh, you have uh, an asset where you know it's uh, it's quite risky and uh, or maybe a, 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 a risky asset or maybe a, you are looking for some kind of insurance on that uh, on that project or of your business or something. Uh, you are going to go to the insurance market and look for an insurance. So you are going to contact various in, in <coughs> various insurance agents and insurance companies and you are going to try your or try to sell your. Uh, try to get an insurance of your product, or if you have an insurance which is uh, which is uh, very profitable, you might sell that insurance contract to some other company. So that happens in an insurance market. Foreign exchange market is basically uh, the foreign exchanges which uh, get traded. For example, you always have uh, different uh, currencies or money which uh, you know changes in their purchasing po purchasing power. Uh, so that is being uh, that 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 is exchanged in a in a foreign currency where you have contracts where you hold one kind of currency and uh, a, a ratio between two currencies the exchange uh, value and you try to um, earn profits when the exchange value changes either the exchange value will uh, i mean the difference will either be become less or it might uh, it, it the gap might widen and you're going to make uh, a profit on that spread so that's the forex market. Uh, the foreign exchange market is also called as the forex market. And um, then you have, uh, the, I mean, uh, this capital market. Capital market is a part of uh, stock market where you have the primary and the secondary market, where <coughs> a new company is going to uh, sell its uh, shares or distribute its its share among its investors in the primary market. This can take place via an exchange or without an exchange. You might have public offering where you have certain part of uh, investment along with you, and uh, uh, and you rest of the investment which is required for starting that firm or running that operation or you know starting a project. You might uh, offer shares to the public, and that's uh, that can be done using an IPO, uh, which is your primary market. And secondary markets are basically markets where you already ex have existing shares which are being traded in the market. So. That's the secondary market. So these are certain uh, certain things about the market market fundamentals. Uh, do you have any questions so far? I mean, it's pretty basic, but still. I will ex explain uh, derivatives. What they are? Uh, they they have to do with uh, call puts and options. And basically, uh, derivatives. I will uh, I will I will uh, I will explain that part when when I get into calls and options. But anything uh, fundamental to the markets, like uh, any anything, any other questions?
I think it's gnome, so I will proceed. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, top stock markets, uh, stock exchanges are basically where uh, stock of companies are going to get exchanged. So uh, they are traded over the counter, over the counter. Like uh, for example, if you want to buy HP shares, you you can actually you need to have a trading account. Once you have a trading account with an everyday stock exchange, any point of time you can buy uh, those equities, and uh, whenever you wish, you can sell your equities. Uh, there are stock exchanges uh, at least in each and every country, and where the domestic countries are going to domestic companies are going to lease themselves there are some exchanges which also allows uh, foreign companies multinational companies which are going to lease themselves in various exchanges uh, which are you know uh, and, and in in various exchanges so the top exchanges which we know by like the stock exchanges are like uh, new new york stock exchange nasdaq then japan exchange group we have uh, london stock exchange shanghai stock exchange National Stock Exchange, NSE of India, and Bombay Stock Exchange, which is also in India. These are some few top exchanges, but every country has one of the exchanges where stocks are stocks get traded. Then we have commodity exchanges as well. Commodity exchanges where you know commodities and derivative products are exchanged. Most commodity markets across the world are like uh, they trade in as I as I mentioned, like they trade in agricultural products and. Uh, like on other raw materials like wheat, you have barley, sugar, maize, cotton, cocoa, coffee, milk products, pop, beer, pork, bellies, uh, you have sausages, orange juice, tomato juice, soy sauce. Uh, this this things gets traded in a in a in a commodity exchange. And then you have metals as well, metals as I said, like zinc, copper, nickel, lead, uh, you have uh, uh, um, gold, silver, platinum, uranium, uh, they get traded in, in, in an exchange. So you have bullions and non-bullion exchanges. And in commodity exchanges you also have uh, carbon credits which gets uh, exchanged in uh, like in terms of uh, emissions. So you have carbon green energy, I mean green companies, they have these carbon credits or a company who has uh, Earned carbon credits, they will trade it against uh, in 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 the climate exchange or or in the energy exchange, and you have climate X as well. Climate X is uh, like you have environmental instruments where you have you hedge your environmental factors. I will explain what this are later on in the uh, in this lecture. Uh, Famous uh, exchanges, commodity exchanges are C C CME Group, uh, like uh, you have the Cbot, Fair, Comex, uh, you have Nymex, and then we have other exchanges like Dubai Gold and Commodity Exchanges, the Multi Commodity Exchange in India, National Spot Exchange Limited in India, which is NSE's Commodity Exchange, the National Commodity and Derivative Exchange, NCDX, then Shanghai Futures Exchange. London Metal Exchange, European Energy Exchange, Chicago Climate Exchange, etc. Uh, the stock markets and the commodity markets have something called as an indice uh, or the index. So you might have heard of uh, Nifty or Sensex, uh, S&P 500, uh, Nikkei, FTSE. So these are indexes, various indexes. So what what happens? What generally happens is uh, they take a stock basket or a commodity basket where they they will they will do an weighted average of uh, those. Index. So index is basically a collection of uh, what is happening to uh, different countries. For example, uh, different stocks and uh, commodities. For example, the S and P 500 is a 500 uh, companies. They have they have taken 500 American companies where they have a standard companies like HP and uh, you know HP, Microsoft and uh, other banking companies. So they they take a variety of companies and they will take some uh, energy companies and stuff and they will like mining companies and stuff and they will put some weight on those companies like how big those companies are and how much uh, they drive the market for example google is uh, one of the company which is a very driving factor you have uh, general motor which is a driving factor general electric which is a big company so these are the major players right the major banks if you, if you look at the american bank or you know 
uh, or Verizon or Sprint uh, telecom companies. So this this are major companies. So uh, this this uh, the S and P consists of uh, major companies, and they will they will take a little bit uh, small companies as well, and they will create a 500. They will create an index and. That's a S and P 500 index. So, depending on how the market is behaving and uh, how the rates are going, this uh, index is going to change. So, if this 500 companies, the uh, the prices of most of the companies are going up, you will see an S and P American S and P index uh, index going up, the weighted average going up. And if it is, uh, you know, if the market is falling, you will see the index is going down. It's basically used for comparison uh, of how the market is doing. It's an aggregate kind of thing. So that's that's something the market is going to you know look at. They are going to ask for how the index is doing, and they will get an idea of uh, what uh, how the market is behaving. So, <clears throat> yeah. Okay, Jewel, no issues. I will explain it uh, explain it to you later on. Uh, any other questions? So far on indices, maybe. Cool. Okay, so in investments, what we what what we do in uh, financial investments is uh, we we can invest on stocks, we can invest on bonds, we can invest on physical assets, mutual funds, or options and futures. Okay. So stocks are basically equities. These are ownership interest. Like for example, when you are starting a company, you will have certain amount of preferred share. Preferred shares are the initial shares, or which uh, which the board of directors and the investors and the financiers of those companies, uh, people who have uh, issued debts to that company, they are going to hold certain equities. This will be your preferred share. Preferred shares are the shareholders which get the dividends, and uh, they they are they are going to get when the asset is being liquidated they are going to get their uh, money or uh, their their interest will be served uh, before the other uh, uh, shareholders which are the common com which are the holders of common stock now common stocks are basically which are being traded in a stock exchange uh, this is uh, this is the excessive uh, this is the this is a different kind of stock where which is used for raising money uh, from the from the public, so those are issued using the IPO, and then it gets traded in the secondary market in the stock exchanges. So equities are basically profit and loss. So you have a profit and loss risk in equities. So these are basically ownerships which are getting traded in your market. Like uh, if you have a company, if you are holding a common share or a preferred share, uh, I mean, uh, uh, you you become a owner of uh, that particular, I mean, uh, to a certain extent of that particular company. Uh, bonds are debts. Basically, bonds will uh, <clears throat> like uh, yesterday when we were discussing bank economy and state. Uh, if we, if I'm giving you a debt, I will have, I will give you a debt at a particular interest rate, and the interest rates keep on changing in the market. I mean, uh, you might uh, lend somebody as at an X rate, so uh, the interest rate in the market will go up and down. So you will have X plus the change of rate and or x minus the change of rate and and you will have a difference between what uh, what rate you are lending and what is the gap between the going interest rate and uh, on that you will uh, the yield of the bond is decided so that's that's how that's how bonds work in the in the bond market where you have the interest rate going up and if you have issued a bond which is at a lower price the Price of the bond is going to fall. Uh, if you have uh, issued uh, a bond or you've given a debt on a very higher price and higher interest rate, and the interest rate going interest rate is much more lower than your bond prices are, the yield is going to increase, and that bond is going to sell at a higher price. Uh, physical assets people buy and hold in physical assets. So you have fixed deposits, uh, which is a physical asset you deposit in a bank for lending. So that's that's uh, that's uh, that's it. Uh, sorry. That's a bond, and if you have physical assets like people buy gold or silver and they store it in, uh, I mean, they keep it with themselves for you know they believe that in future that uh, um, the price of uh, that physical assets is going to appreciate. People buy uh, flats or real estate and they expect a price rise 
so those are physical assets which you can hold real estate stuff and, and uh, gold or silver or bullions um, and then you have mutual funds mutual funds are basically you have uh, you have bankings and financial institutes which are going to start mutual fund and various investors are going to come in the mutual fund will have certain uh, certain criteria like they're going to the there will be a fund manager uh, the fund manager is going to decide like uh, how to invest your stocks uh, how to invest your money into different stocks and bonds so they're going to figure out like uh, if they're going to how much they're going to invest in what kind of stocks and what kind of bonds they're going to buy and there will be several people who are going to buy this mutual fund so all their money is going to be accumulated and the fund manager is going to invest that into different financial instruments so that's basically the uh, mutual funds things options and futures are derivatives uh, basically what derivatives means is uh, they they are simply contracts right they future contracts uh, I mean options are basically called as derivatives future contracts is different in options you have call and put these are rights which are uh, which are sold in the market where you know if you if you if you want to buy a certain thing at a future date at a fixed price uh, that uh, that you are going to use you are going to buy a call or a put depending on how your market outlook is uh, they the this this contracts they do not have their own individual value what they get their value is from these spot prices like uh, for example if I am going to sign a future contract uh, like uh, let's say I want to buy steel after a year I'm not sure of what the price is it, it it doesn't have a price it's a future goods right it's not a finished group I, there is no idea of what the market price will be at that point of time but uh, when we are signing that contract or when we are agreeing to buy that contract the value of that future good will be you know derived from a, the present good which is the spot price or which is the going price right now at the market so the future good itself or the future contract itself does not have its own inherent uh, value kind of thing and its value is derived from the spot price or the going price right now the price at the market at this point of time so you are going to make uh, so so if the if the going price changes your options and uh, the premium on your options and uh, what the future prices will change so it's it's going to derive its price from the going price so it's called as derivatives so that's the basic of derivatives and this is what derivatives are and there are different ways how we uh, we organize this uh, this con this type of contracts which I'm going to explain later on further in the lecture um, do you have any questions so far How exactly do they pick the companies to look at? You generally have no control of how the mutual funds are invested. Uh, actually, what what happens is the fund manager is going to give you give you like uh, he has a record or he is going to give you his plan. Like I am going to invest. Uh, it it depends on the fund manager basically. Like uh, his how much he is going to invest. So he is going to give you a segregation on based on like. Uh, Okay, I'm going to know you know what I'm going to invest 20% of uh, your investment into gold, 20% uh, into bonds. Uh, rest of uh, your money will go into like IT companies, 10%, 10% into energy companies, 10% into mining companies, so on and so forth. Like uh, whatever the fund manager decides, and they are going to decide like uh, what will be the amount of that fund, like how much, how big will be the mutual fund, will how much. Uh, how much people they are going to sell that uh, how much money are they going to invest into the market using that mutual fund so that uh, that size of that mutual fund so the fund manager is going to define uh, determine that uh, mutual fund product like uh, they have this fund like uh, there will be several mutual funds and the fund manager is going to decide like what which mutual fund what where they are going to invest like for example there might be a mutual fund which is only going to invest in banking stocks so different banks they are going to say that uh, okay this is the top nationalized bank or this is the top bank this is the uh, this is a big bank and I'm going to buy 60 percent shares of this big bank and there is a new bank uh, which uh, the fund manager believes are, is going to do very well in the market in the future so he will say that uh, I'm going to buy 10 percent here in in small banks or other banks um, which are new banks I'm going to put in 10% and 30% rest of the 30% what you have you're going to put in into other banks which is uh, you know already 
existing and quite stable banks. So that is how uh, they will present the mutual funds to the people who are willing to invest in that mutual funds. And then the fund uh, funds get traded in the market where once the funds start and then you have the um, dividends coming up against the fund and the value of the stocks either appreciates in the market. So if it appreciates, you will have each each mutual fund unit is going to cost more, so you will trade those units. So that's how mutual funds basically work. Uh, does that answer your question, Shashank? Cool. So actors in a market. Any any anyone has anyone else has any other questions? Okay, no issues. Uh, the actors in market, uh, there is an exchange like uh, a stock exchange or a commodity exchange and insurance exchange. The entity who is going to you know, look after the exchange, they are going to provide you the exchange platform uh, or a marketplace. Okay, like uh, you have a vegetable market, somebody has that place, right, where the exchange is taking place. It's a physical place, exchange place. Uh, you have regulators, regulators who are going to like basically the government who is who regulates the market. There is uh, they have a body uh, of uh, you know regulators so that uh, they look into uh, they they will try to you know uh, look after like uh, there are any malpractices or or any frauds which is taking place or any rigging which is taking place in the market. So uh, they are they are going to check the market. They are going to audit the market. They are they are going to audit this marketplaces uh, and try to set certain rules and stuff so that the market operations are pretty honest and people do not uh, get into uh, get into malpractices Just hold on a second is the BPD visible now Okay, so you have issuers. Issuers are uh, people uh, who are going to issue your IPOs, who are going to come into the market. These are basically entrepreneurs or business owners who are, or mutual fund, uh, you know, financial institutions or mutual funds or you know, uh, who who sell mutual funds or who work, uh, whose whose profession is to manage mutual funds. So they are going to come and they are going to issue their initial units or shares into the market. So these are these are another set of actors who are going to be present in the market who are going to lease their I mean new companies who wants to lease their new companies and stuff they they are the issuers of uh, new shares or uh, new new goods in the market so these are issuers and then you have intraday traders intraday traders are basically who will be into you know will just uh, try to make uh, money in in one particular day they don't do not actually hold the product for a long time and they, they just want to buy certain goods and move using the trends and I'm going to discuss intraday trading later on in the in the mark in the in the in this lecture. We have promoters of companies where you know uh, companies where promoters basically try to you know they are marketing kind of they are kind of a marketing people who are going to go and find any investors who are going to talk to different uh, retail uh, uh, there are different people, financial institutions, and uh, and also retail public, and they're going to say that okay, this is a big, big company. This is this is a project which uh, you know is going to yield good profit. So they market their shares and they will try to sell their shares to different people, like uh, buy uh, like uh, buy Reliance shares of uh, or HP shares. HP is going to come up with a good uh, project or a good uh, product in the future, and you should really buy this uh, stock and you should hold the stock for two or three years or something like that so these are promoters uh, market operators are people who you know you have uh, I mean at, at point at certain point of time a company would like to go for you know investment or they want to they want to go for bank loans or debts uh, or they want to Share, uh, sell off their shares at a good price. So this, uh, these people will go to the operators. Operators, they they actually try to rig their prices. Rig. I mean, it's not rigging. It's basically they will try to buy and sell the existing shares from the market and try to appreciate it into a price, or they will try to sell a share at 
one particular price in the market so if you ask an operator like uh, you want uh, to sell particular you have a number of share a big stock of shares and you want to sell it at one particular price range uh, like for example you are holding some shares which uh, is the going price is like 20 at the market and you want uh, to sell out uh, a million worth of uh, that shares uh, so you're going to give it to the operator and you're going to ask him to sell it between uh, 19 to 21 rupees, uh, $21 in the market. So the operator is going to take uh, care like uh, the market is always going to fluctuate, right? If you are going to dump a million's worth of share, not going to get a good price. So the operators are basically going to operate in the market like uh, they are going to watch the prices and they are going to play there. I mean they are going to sell those uh, stocks at that particular price uh, when, whenever they can find an opportunity to do so. Uh, there there are other other uh, scenarios where you know you want to buy a different company so you need to have a big holding of, uh, of that particular the other company that you are trying to buy or you are going to get into merger or ac acquire that company you need to buy a certain amount of uh, the stocks from the market right you want to buy the equity for example if no if microsoft wants to purchase out nokia it has to it it will start buying that uh, the stocks of nokia from the market now suddenly if you are putting a, a big amount of money uh, into the market uh, for buying like microsoft puts in a millions of dollars into the market it fuses that and it's keeps it, it wants to do it in one trade where it's going to ask for let's say uh, 20,000 shares of uh, Nokia the market price is going to appreciate a lot so they again go to the operators and they say okay we want to buy this at this particular price range and we want to buy about 20% uh, or 30% of the market share so the operators are going to you know they are going to have their strategies and they will try to buy it at the best possible price in the market so whenever there is a market correction or the market is not uh, doing good at that particular day the market trend is very you know uh, bad at that day they will start purchasing those shares at a very cheaper cost and when the market is good they will try to sell those and you know somehow manage the profit and the margins and that is the role of the operators in the market and then you have investment bankers investment bankers who take your pension funds uh, and investment funds and salaries they try to maximize it into they they get into into investment operations uh, and they have some big clients or industrialists with uh, you know with uh, premium accounts and they try to pay a bit better interest uh, they have this e equity linked or stock market link accounts in there in their in there with them so investment bankers are basically who are going to take that banking money whatever they have and they will try to invest in the market uh, you have foreign investors where you know in a, in a stock market or a commodity market uh, you will have investors from other different countries who wants to invest in stocks and stuff uh, stocks and commodities or buy purchase uh, contracts of which is which is local to your economy or your market so they they are the foreign investors so basically they they, they get some uh, authority from the market and uh, i mean from the regulators to invest uh, a certain amount in their in in other in your in to buy stocks from that country's exchange so for example if an american wants to buy uh, stocks from uh, in, a, in a chinese market from the shanghai exchange so he cannot directly do so because there are regulatory uh, regulations in the market so you have the regulators the government and uh, the currency changes and stuff so they will uh, they will they they have a different uh, different uh, way of uh, doing that investment so they have to open a foreign investors account and they have to buy some they will get a limit like uh, you cannot invest more than this amount of money and there will be some cap on them for foreign investment investors so if the trade deficits are like uh, it depends on the government policies and stuff so that's uh, the foreign investors are basically the people outside uh, your country or your nation who is going to invest in your in 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 in, in stocks or commodities uh, we have brokers brokers are basically there are I mean in every exchanges uh, have certain brokers or there are stock brokers who are going to manage your portfolios and stuff they are going to uh, take some brokerage out of you I mean in certain countries uh, the retail public cannot directly trade they have to go via broker for example it is in India where you have uh, different broking firms the broking firms actually uh, provide you service like they will give you a trading account uh, and a trading platform where you can actually buy 
shares and stuff and then they they manage your portfolio some manage their portfolio or some brokers where you know you have to call in and tell them to buy purchase this uh, uh, purchase this uh, particular stocks or you know investment instrument at this particular price so broker will take a small brokerage and they will they will buy purchase stuff for you uh, they also lend uh, I mean for short selling which I'm going to uh, explain in the in in a few minutes uh, they they will lend you some <coughs> the, the stocks which they have the, in their broker pool uh, jobbers jobbers are people who are going to hold a very decent amount of stocks for a very short time what what jobbers do is uh, normally they are going to hold stock for half of the day or for uh, simply at times for a few minutes they are going to buy a like 1000 shares or 20000 shares or a huge amount of shares for a minute or 3 minutes or 5 minutes just to you know just to make a profit if they see that the price is going to fall for in another two minutes or three minutes or maybe by noon or something they're going to hold a big chunk of shares and they're going to go either short or long on the market uh, arbitragers are arbitragers are for example if uh, there is uh, there is a difference of prices between two markets for example if they if the reliance stock is uh, uh, is, is trading in Reliance is an Indian company so if uh, that stock is uh, getting traded in uh, BSC and NSE and there is a difference in the price so they will try to buy shares from the NSE and they will try to sell it in uh, you know uh, they will try to buy the stock from the uh, where the price is high and uh, where the price is low and sell it to the other other exchange where the price is high so they do this kind of uh, stuff so there are arbitragers in the market which uh, you know are going to buy the same product and they're going to sell it in in a different market uh, for example if uh, if uh, if if uh, there is a price difference like for example let's say gold is getting traded in uh, dubai gold and commodity exchange and london stock metal exchange so they have their accounts uh, at both places and if the london uh, metal exchange the gold prices go up we know that the dubai gold and commodity price is going to follow uh, uh, follow the London Metal Exchange price. So what they're going to do is they're going to buy gold at uh, LME and they're going to sell gold that gold into into du uh, sorry they're going to buy that gold from Dubai Gold and Commodity Exchange and they're going to sell it on uh, on uh, uh, London Metal Exchange. So what is going to happen is like uh, after the arbitrage start arbitraging the price in both the exchanges are going to you know stabilize and come to uh, the same point and that is how it price to reach an equilibrium between the different markets different commodity markets and uh, different uh, stock markets they uh, within even 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 within the uh, within their own country they they will their prices are going to be pretty similar or they're going to balance out themselves so do you have any questions Uh, jobbers, what what jobbers do are jobbers are basically intraday traders. Uh, what they do is like, for example, uh, they look at the market debt uh, depth. Uh, market depth is uh, somewhere like uh, we know we the exchange gives you like five top prices or how many buyers are there in the market and how many sellers are there in the market. What the jobber does is uh, the jobber is uh, going to buy a big bulk of shares or stocks or you know commodities and uh, commodity contracts and he's going to wait for a price change between uh, the next few minutes like if there is a trend so jobber is going to buy a lot of stock uh, at uh, at one particular second and he's going to sell it out in uh, in in it's the prediction is basically it, it's it's basically like for example if uh, it it's on the trend it's on the given day where you know jobbers have been it's very it's it's very speculative the entire investment market is uh, speculative so uh, you have to speculate like uh, if there are more buyers and uh, less sellers then you know what what is going to happen right it, you, what what the tendency of the prices will be so if you have more buyers in the market uh, like uh, you see that uh, the prices are going up and it's a, there is a trend like uh, for the next uh, two minutes the prices have been moving out uh, up uh, so you will take you are more likely to take a risk that the price is going to move another small you know they the, the jobbers work on a very small unit of change like they work on a very small change like for example if you're an intraday trader someone someone would be looking at a dollar uh, of uh, 50 cents uh, movement or uh, or or you know 
if you are having 10 stocks so you will have a brokerage also in your head so uh, you are going to look uh, look for like 50 cents uh, change for you is not uh, that much of a big earning right because you only only have uh, 10 shares a jobber is going to have 10,000 shares so that 50 cents movement for a jobber is a big thing so they are going to look for this kind of small changes in the market and they trade uh, using that amount and because these jobbers are buying at, at, a, at a very large volume of shares they normally attract a very low brokerage cost as well so their overheads are pretty low and this is this is how they operate that is what jobbers do in the market uh, does that answer your question Okay. Uh, futures and derivatives. Uh, you have uh, spot contracts. Uh, this is spot is uh, the going price. For example, if I ask you, like, uh, if you look at the market data right now, uh, there are there are goods which are getting traded in uh, NYMEX or COMEX. If you look at the market data, if I ask you, what is the price of crude oil? Uh, right now, crude oil is being traded, right? So we know at the spot market what is what is the going price of crude oil we know what 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 price the buyers are you know buying crude oil barrels of crude oil and selling uh, what is the what is the price right now so that is the spot price i mean the spot price is the price where the the gold uh, i mean the crude traders are selling their goods at at this present day the ready ready goods uh, based on that there is a futures contract kind of thing the exchange floats uh, future contracts uh, future contracts will be um, based on so, some are based on month uh, some are like uh, you have a far date far date is the date from the present date how far your future contract is it might be a month far it might be two months far or three months far, far six months far or some some contracts are even five or ten years far from the present date so if you are buying a contract uh, you will have this future contracts where crude oil you will have for the month of January so there is an expiry period or an expiry date on a futures contract like uh, uh, January that the, it normally expires at the last Thursday of uh, of the month or if that Thursday is goes into next month it takes place on a Wednesday so something of that sort right so you have this future contract which is going to expire at the last Thursday of the month and that is the expiry date that you will have on the futures contract so if I look at January January uh, the contract uh, the for crude oil will be somewhere around uh, in in 29th of January it's going to expire so today the going price of crude oil might be fifty dollars and uh, what what should be the price of January right so January is uh, you will have some kind of a discount on January, right? So the January price will be uh, somewhere like uh, 51 or 52. If how how you're anticipating the market, so you will have that uh, price like uh, the January contract of 29, uh, 29th, uh, which is going to expire on 29th. You will say that uh, okay, 51 will be the futures price. So this future prices are there will be a price spread as uh, it uh, you know future contracts. There will be always a discount which is the interest rate uh, which is calculated and um, and this is how the predictions are made and uh, also the speculation like the demand in January the crude oil demand might go up or down depending on that there will be a spread between the current going price and the future price so the future price will be always higher than the spot prices or mostly is higher than the spot prices if it reverses then the spot prices definitely has to fall um, so if you buy that January's 29th contract, so that means that you are you are going to buy that that uh, a barrel of crude oil at, at 51 dollars per barrel. So that's that's how that's how the future contracts will be. A call option is different. Call options will have strike prices for a particular expiry month. Uh, for example, if I am saying in January there will be a strike price of 51, 52, 53, 54, 55, 56. Uh, here what you're doing is uh, you're going to select like what the price will be uh, a call option is like if you select the price of 51 uh, and on 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 that expiry date if the price is 56 or 57 you make a profit 
and if the price falls down or below you just lose the premium and nothing 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 more than that so it's an agreement a call option is a derivative contract it's an agreement which uh, gives the investor the right but not the obligation to buy a stock at that particular day uh, it's a right that you have like if you want to buy those stock at that stock price in that particular day you can buy it if you don't want it you just lose your premium interest and that's it so that's how the call 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 options work a put option is different put option is where let's say the current going price is fifty dollars per barrel of uh, crude oil and you feel that it will go down at uh, you will go it will go down to forty five in the month of january so you will buy a put option of 45 for the month of January 29th and if the crude oil falls below 45 you're going to make a profit if it stays up you're going to lose your premium so that's that's how the call and put options work the future contracts do not have uh, have a strike price the call options have a strike price and put options also have a strike price the strike strike price is the price at the future which uh, you are predicting like this above this price or below this price a futures contract is some some something where you know you already know the price what what price you are going to get in at like uh, if it is a 51 rupees price which is available at the at the market right now you're going to buy that right now and that's the price for you after a month a call option and a put option and that's a future option is a delivery right you have to take the delivery at that particular price or you have to settle it in cash a call option and a put option is not a a contract where you are going to take the delivery it's just the right you have it's not it's it's not the obligation but in a future contract you have an obligation that you have to buy it at that particular price uh, here you just will lose the premium and that's it so that's what uh, spot futures and uh, and and you know options are so uh, do you have any questions No questions. Good. Uh, buy, sell, and short sell. We, I mean, most of us know what buying and selling is, right? If you have a stock uh, with you, you're going to sell it, and if you have a, if you want to purchase the stock, you're going to buy it. But there is something called a short sell or short selling. It's the sell of a security which you do not own. Basically, you borrow the security or the stock. For example, the if in in a layman's term, you don't have you don't have to buy anything or sell anything. What you're going to do is you're going to borrow something. The idea is when the market, uh, let's say in the morning or when the market opens, you have a price and you you expect that the price will fall by the evening. So what you're going to do is you're going to borrow some stock from the stockholder. Like for example, you're going to go to the merchant and you're going to say that okay, give me the stock at uh, in the morning. You you will borrow that stock. You will say, give me 10, 10 pieces of this particular good, and you will sell it at the market, and you expect a price fall in the evening, uh, and where the price will lower will be low than what it has opened in the market. So you are going to buy those 10 stocks again from the market, the 10 goods that you had sold in the morning. You are going to buy it at lower price in the evening, and you are going to return that to the to the to the market from whom you had borrowed. So that is short selling. That uh, you actually borrow stocks or contracts and you sell it up on the market at that particular price and you have to make a settlement like in the evening you have to return those stocks so the profit and loss how it happens is if the market price falls as expected by you you make a profit if it doesn't fall and it goes up you may have to buy it at the higher price and settle it with the with the whosoever you have borrowed or you have to cash settle it and short selling mostly is uh, is uh, is available only to 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 you know it's it's there in it's available only for intraday it's not given for for by for for most exchanges it's not given on long long positions long is for a long duration long time positions where you can you know you can short on something for a year down the line or two years down the line so that's that's how short selling works or uh, do you have any questions for short selling is it does it make sense
okay margins now what happens is uh, the stock market uh, the broker is going to give you a margin now margin is uh, you are not let's say a stock uh, or a good uh, costs uh, it's a hundred dollars so, and it, it will have a margin of a margin amount like the broker is going to set or the exchange is going to set depending on how risky that asset is they're going to set a margin amount on that particular contract or that particular good or that particular stock let's say the margin amount which is required to purchase that security is uh, 15 percent so what you're going to do is uh, let's say that uh, stock will cost you hundred dollars you 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 will you will only need to deposit a margin of fifteen dollars with your broker to buy to hold that stock and this is for a short time like it uh, you have to you you get a margin trading amount for like uh, you get a margin for two or three days within which you have to settle so what you can do is if you have hundred dollars and if you want to take delivery of that particular stock which you want to hold it for a long time you have to pay that hundred dollars and buy that stock when you are playing in margin, what you are going to do is you are going to buy at least uh, four securities of that particular stock. You can buy four shares of that particular stock using the 15% margin. So instead of one, you are actually trading with uh, four four stocks using the margin amount, using the margin, the borrowing from your broker or from the exchange, uh, which. Uh, which is like uh, mostly people trade in margin when uh, I mean you can do short selling as well as uh, long long you can go long on 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 or with the with the margin trading it's just the you're just going to increase the your profit per share using a margin trading like you don't have to take the delivery but uh, what you have to, what the problem is that uh, when the price does not work as per your expectation then you have to sell it and you you, you lose your margin amount so that's that's the risk like uh, the the broker is going to square off if the price is going down and if the if your margin amount is getting diminishing uh, what i mean by that it let's say if you have taken four stocks uh, of a particular particular company uh, which was going at hundred dollars, and you you use your margin and you purchase that stock at hundred hundred dollars. Uh, you have you are holding four stocks, and the market price is going up for that. Uh, like it is going up, it it is uh, trading at twenty percent or let's say ten percent above above what the price that you purchase. So you are actually at profit, and there is no fear, and your margin amount uh, or the amount that is there in your ledger in your trading ledger. Is actually uh, the market value is much more than what you had purchased, right? The stock value is right now at 115 or 120, so you are actually at a at a, at a situation of profit. But uh, let's say if the price has gone fallen down, so we, let's say it is falling by, uh, it has fallen to uh, to 85. That means you have lost your margin amount, right? So the broker is simply going to square off your your uh, your the stocks that you had purchased using your margin. And you're going to lose the margin amount. So that's how the brokers manage this uh, margin trading. Uh, this is what uh, margin is all about. Do you have any questions? Wow, no questions. Intraday and delivery. Intraday is uh, something where you know the broker is going to give you a limit uh, I mean mostly in India it, it's uh, around two or three days or uh, it depends like uh, what what the relationship with your broker is some broker takes a deposit security deposit amount some some give you like five days some give you seven days seven seven trading days some give you 15 trading days to you know actually stay on the margin and not take uh, take a delivery it depends on the exchange as well intraday is something which uh, you know at the you have to settle whatever uh, position you have on your margin uh, that particular day. Most, mostly the intraday comes in when when you're trading with margin amount. If you've paid the complete amount, it doesn't matter. Uh, you have already made the complete uh, you know payment of uh, whatever stock or commodity that you want to buy. But uh, with intraday, if you have taken something on margin and you don't want the broker to sell off those stocks, you want to hold on to hold on to that stock. You have to deposit or you have to make more payments so that uh, you know you. You stay. In, you still keep on holding that uh, particular stock that you have. Uh, the other thing which is different is uh, the when you when you take a delivery. That means that the stock after the end of the day, 
it's going to get uh, deposited in your DMAT account. So if you have a contract uh, or a stock, you have a DMAT account with uh, with the broker or the trading company that you are you you have an account with the trading company. So it gets deposited there. So uh, basically, it takes about a couple of days for let's say if you are buying HP shares, uh, you can actually go for you know when you when you when you when you are buying let's say if it's a trading at 100 so if you have if you're going for a margin you're going to buy four four stock if you're not going to go for a margin you're going to take a delivery or just going to buy one stock what happens is at that point of time the broker is not uh, aware like if you've gone for an intraday or a delivery there is no way of knowing that the settlement is done by the end of the day or uh, depending on the price which is going and the difference form with your margin yeah, uh, Shashank uh, has a question like, uh, is margin simply a loan from the broker? Yes, it's a it's a loan from the broker. It's kind of a loan from the broker where you have a margin amount on uh, every stock. Uh, for example, as I said, like HP is a is a big company and it, its uh, rate does not fluctuate that much in the market. So it might have a market premium set by the regulators or the exchange of uh, you know five uh, percent or the broker might set a five percent margin on that. So if you have hundred dollars, you can buy actually twenty-five shares of HP in the from the market. Okay, and uh, if the prices are going up, you are in profit, right? So your margin amount it doesn't it doesn't matter. The broker is already he doesn't have to worry about uh, you know your margin. But if the price is falling down, that means your margin amount is getting depreciated, right? Uh, like if uh, for each uh, uh, each uh, cent that it each each dollar that it is falling. Uh, it's actually getting uh, your, your your margin amount is has gone down by 25 rupees, right? Uh, I mean 25 dollars. So that is that is how they will look like uh, after four dollar uh, the price falls for four dollar. You have already lost your margin amount in the market. So they are going to simply uh, sh uh, sell off your share at that particular price, and that's 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 the margin. Sometimes you get into a negative margin where the stock price uh, falls, uh, you know, uh, much more than what you expect. There might be a sudden crash and you you are having uh, you were trading at margin and even if the broker squares of your amount there is a deficit and there is a i mean a, you, you owe something to your broker so he is going to charge that uh, money from you you have an obligation to pay that uh, money to him so it's basically a loan it's a it's a it's a borrowing from your your broker or, or uh, that's 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 how it is Do you have any questions between for uh, intraday and delivery? Okay. Uh, there is uh, there is another concept in the market which is the bull and the bear. Uh, bulls are basically investors who thinks that uh, you know the market and the industries is going to. Do. He's he's an optimistic person. He is he is always looking at uh, you know he, he always believes that the market is going to move up. And the bears are opposite of a bull. So he he is like uh, no, there will be a, mostly Austrians are like that. They are always waiting for a crash. Or the market is going to crash. It's a, it's a, it's not the right amount. You know the market is overvalued right right now. So so that's that's basically how, how the intention is. It's a, the bear is a very pessimistic person, and he's always waiting for. I mean they both have a trading uh, trading uh, you know technique like the optimistic. He is going to look for you know whenever there is an optimistic trend, he is going to take uh, high risk and he is going to get into enter the market. And beer is always uh, you know watchful and he is going to lose out on those uh, trends. He is not going to invest. He is going to hold for a, you know hold back for a crash, and the crash is not coming and the market uh, has moved moved up into a, into a very you know big uh, in, a, in a in a position where you know at a, at, a, at a peak position and. The, the peer actually has lost a lot of opportunities, but then suddenly the market crashes and the you know the bull loses. I mean, there are many people who are going to lose their money, and the beer will be very happy. Oh, look, the market has crashed now. I will buy my shares. So we, I, I will buy these stock, stocks at at a cheap uh, rate, and I will sell them when they are high. So bulls and bears are investors in market who has got. Uh, I mean, one is very optimistic, one is very pessimistic, and then you have a concept called less. <laughs> Picks, picks are unsure of what is going on in the market. They just, uh, they just believe anyone. They will follow news. They will follow. They will not do any analysis of their own, or they will be overconfident, like uh, 
they 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 do not have i mean they they are basically bad investors who are mostly going to lose their money they don't have directions they don't know what they don't, don't understand the market they don't have the market sense and they they take unwanted risk and they panic in the market so these are we, we call them pigs and pigs are going to get slaughtered in the market and that's a saying that uh, if you're if you're not sure of what you're doing you're going to lose your money so basically either you are a bull or a bear you have a strategy you have an understanding of how the market works and what is going on in the market you can you are actually a good speculator even if you're optimistic or a pessimistic like the bull knows when he has to exit the market and the bear knows when he has to get in the market or when when you have to exit the market so that's basically bull and bear uh any questions for bulls and bears mhm mm no nope. okay fundamental analysis uh, now uh, stock analysts uh, do a lot of uh, different type of analysis one is fundamental analysis fundamental analysis is where you try to figure out if the stock is uh, you know at uh, at trading at the right Uh, value or is it overpriced or underpriced right so what the stock analyst basically what he does is he look at he looks at the microeconomic factor like the economy is good or bad and he he will try to figure out like uh, he he will do some quantitative factors like what is the what is uh, uh what is this company all about uh, if this company has large amount of debts on its head and uh, how the company is doing is it is it selling its goods or not Uh, is it making any profit or not is as profit increase from last year or not so these are what fundamental analysts do they they look into the balance sheet they look into the cash flow they look into the dividends that has been given to the market and they also compare it with the average price like if it is uh, they consider that mostly if uh, if the security is trading over an average price then uh, then that is an overpriced uh, stock and if it is a it is a trading below a moving average then uh, when uh, that's an underpriced uh, stock so this is uh, this is what they believe in and this is how they try to you know figure out which stocks put their money in and which stocks they shouldn't put money into so that's fundamental analysis where you get into the balance sheets you you do accounting actually you look at the books of the company and try to figure out how the company is going to do and you make a comparison with the economic factors like uh, if if the trend is bullish or bearish and how the economy is how the government is what is the uh what is the market uh, mood right now is it is it very bearish or is it very bullish and the, based on that you make those so uh, you know uh, uh, analysis about uh, uh it's basically checking the historical data and uh, and and trying to make trying to figure out how fundamentally sound this company is like there are some companies who do not uh, take a lot of debts they do not take a lot of risk they have a very you know they they have a very uh very stable market uh, kind of thing for example uh companies which uh, which makes uh, like honda or toyota or you know Uh, these are very stable companies they they don't uh, take uh, as much risk or you know their fundamentals are pretty good but where if you look at some tech companies or some cell cell phone companies which are you know which are very which are which are you know in a in a sector where things change quite a lot and uh, it's quite risky so even if they are fundamentally good companies they might uh, you know they might have a lot of debts uh, and that company might crash or there might be some companies who used to be past very good companies but right now they had a lot of debts and they are struggling to earn profits to pay off their debts so that's a fundamental analysis what this fundamental analyst do and uh, mostly fundamental analyst there is another thing that they try to buy stocks uh, a which uh, of of particular company whose liquidation value is uh, you know higher than what the stock prices are in the market so fundamental analyst basically look for sound companies and mostly the mergers and the acquisition companies they they look into the fundamental analysis more uh, than what a normal investors like us look into uh finance technical analysis technical analysis is a security analysis and methodology for forecasting the direction of prices okay now what uh, the technical analyst do it's it it will try to figure out what will the price be what price will be tomorrow or later in the in the future date so they use charts and statistics to figure out what the future price will be okay so 
what they do is they have charts like this one I mean they try to find out a trend now this is a chart stock where you look at uh, the S&P 500 index this is the large cap index what they are where they are talking about uh, large companies and they they uh, this is the chart where you will see the prices from 95 to year 95 to 2000 uh, year 2001 and the prices the index is going continuously there is an upward trend so what they are going to do is they will see that okay the chart I mean they will take a ruler kind of thing and they will draw a simple trend line they will say okay the trend is upward so it's a bull run and invest on 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 in the market if you are pretty safe uh, the problem is that uh, you i mean it's it's i mean basically it's a, i mean anyone can take a ruler or a scale and draw straight lines and figure out where the prices are going right uh, and that's that's how the trend 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 analysis uh, trend analysts do they take a ruler and they try to figure out like where the price will be they will take uh, they will look at the band and the angular dis uh, difference between the top and the lower positions and they will try to figure out where the next trend will be or what the price should be uh, tomorrow or one year down the line like if you look at this trend line this trend is continuously upwards right so we will say i mean you can extend this line to 2025 and you will get a figure you will get a figure on the x-axis and that that should be the price on 2025 and that is how the they, they figure out like what will be the price at 2025 using these kind of trend lines so that's one thing uh, then you have the charts where they use moving averages where you know they they take uh, moving averages of 30 days and 20 days and uh, or 120 days depending on and they they use those moving averages and they will plot a line they will plot the they will get they use charting softwares where you can have uh, you know the existing data of uh, of a particular index or particular stock and you will have the moving averages plotted on it so you have the moving averages there is uh, if you look at the screen there is the stock price and there is an aggregate uh, moving uh, moving average which is you know actually intersecting the uh, in, in uh, the top uh, uh, the stock price or the index price it's the Dow Jones Industrial Index so it's intersecting the Dow Jones in Industrial uh, ex, uh, Industrial uh, uh, the index at uh, various places so if you, the the yellow line is uh, basically the moving average and the green uh, is ca is the candlesticks right yeah Shashank I will answer that later on like uh, how how the Austrians differ uh, but let's uh, look at how the mainstream works how these people work and how their thinking are okay how they how they do the stocks now if you look at uh, the intersections you will see that there are red and green arrows in the moving average right where it is intersecting so if the intersection like uh, if the if the uh, if the stock price is going down it is cutting the moving average and it is lowering down we say that there will be a crash or the prices are going to dip down and if it is if it crosses the moving average and if it moves up we say that we okay the prices are going to appreciate for some time we do not know how much but we always make a prediction like it will be one percent or two percent depending on the trend so that's how they try to determine the prices and if you take a 30 or a 90 days moving average which is at the lower screen and if you see that uh, the blue line uh, the yellow line is uh, for 30 days moving average of stock prices you take the historical prices and you make an average uh, and you have a 90 days period uh, of uh, of the stock prices if the 30 days moving averages crosses the 90 days moving average then you will have a price rise and if it is uh, if 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 it is uh, you know at uh, if if it is uh, intersecting and moving upwards then you will have a positive trend now this is historically possible but if you look at the end of the screen where the market has already crushed crashed and uh, the trend has changed uh, you won't see that reflected in the moving average so this is this is some kind of when when you are standing at the market at the extended position on that particular day and you only make a reading uh, your decision there is no intersection of the moving averages and you do not know where where the average will be and this is sometimes confusing so what the technical uh, people say the technical analysts say that uh, you have to look into different types of trends and charts and different type of moving averages different type of indexes you have to look into RSSI MACD and other stuff to you know uh, other chart patterns also and then you have to come into uh, you have to make those decisions where to invest in stock or not uh, this is something which uh, they use which is called as uh, the head and shoulders uh, bottom where which is a bear signal 
where you have a line, you, they draw a line and they figure out like uh, now this, uh, if you look at uh, this uh, chart, you will see that there are two, uh, there is a pattern where it is cutting one line, there is, uh, uh, you know, two peak periods and there is a line in between that. So if uh, the, uh, the pattern, if you observe this kind of a pattern, I mean the top pattern, then that means that uh, there is a bearish period and when the, when the, uh, there is a neckline kind of thing and you have some kind of a shoulder and a neck kind of thing. Uh, one is the head and one is the left shoulder and the right shoulder. When the right shoulder crosses the neckline, you will have a bullish trend where the, you know the market is going to go up from there. And uh, similarly, you have the beers uh, where the head and shoulder top. Uh, you have a you have a left shoulder, a neck, and a, a head and a right shoulder. If you look at the lower 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 uh, you know chart. And if it crosses below the neckline, then that means you have a bearish signal and the market is going to crash from there. So that's another chart, chart, part, chart pattern that they look at. Uh, you have something which is called as RSI, the Relative State Strength Index, which uh, mostly this uh, trend people they use. Uh, you get an RSI, a Relative Strength Index for 14 days or 50 days or 30 days, depending on uh, how, how long you're looking at, what, how much what is the time period you want to stay invested in and you get a get a signal so you have an overbought and an underbought uh, uh, underbought and an overbought uh, kind of a signal you get on on those on on the RSI where if it is uh, if you are moving average of uh, relative strength index uh, the average crosses uh, of 14 days crosses uh, 70 that means you should exit that stock the stock it has over if it has been overbought and if it falls below 30 that means it's a good price to buy that stock so that's another statistical tool that they use and then you have MACD MACD is uh, again another technical tool that they use using these moving averages and they figure out if the line cross each other what they should do where the trend is going to change so you will see this uh, red line blue lines and stuff you know changing each other the intersections they will say okay there is a fall and uh, there will be a rise in the market so this is what they basically do with uh, technical analysis and there is another 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 way of uh, you know technical analysis uh, this uh, technical analysis what they do is uh, they use something which is called as a candlestick uh, candlestick is basically uh, represented using one candle so they will look at the shape and size of the candle and the pattern of the ca candles and they will try to predict like if the market is going to go up or down okay so you have a, a a single candle is represented by the high open close and low now what what does high means is the high price of that particular day open is the open price that means the first trade what price it took place uh, low is the lowest price that the stock had uh, you know reached in that particular trading day and close is the last price at which uh, the stock closed what the last uh, last price at the stock market so on that particular day so they do it on a day by day pattern and that's the candlestick you get a candlestick and you will have a range uh, if the candle might be big like there might be a very you know a movement of 2 or 3% in a day so you will have a big candle and if you have let's say a 0.01 uh, movement between of of prices in that particular day you will have a small candle so you get a pattern like if you can uh, if you if you look at the chart below you get candles of various shapes and sizes right so you get patterns out of that and they try to predict uh, using patterns like you have a uh, this is one pattern analysis candlestick pattern analysis where they are trying to figure out hey guys are you able to hear me yeah uh, sorry I had some technical dif difficulties I got knocked out of, of uh, the you know the hangout uh, anyways, uh, so how far did I complete? Like, what was the last thing that you got to heard here from me? I think we were doing the candlestick patterns. Uh, you had a chart and you were explaining. This one? Uh, actually, you need to share the screen. I'm not seeing it. Uh, yeah, yeah, that would be one. Hold on a second. I think it should be sharing, right? Okay, start screen share. Able to see it? Yeah. Okay, so what I was saying is like uh, you get this patterns, uh, various patterns that uh, you know you, this is a 
uh, this is a bullish pattern where they try to figure out like what the candlestick pattern is they get to see uh, now here you can see a pattern which is like a flag uh, you have a flag pole over there and a flag like this so they say that this kind of a pattern if you see this kind of a pattern in your candlestick that means it's a start of a bearish uh, sorry a bullish trend and then there will be patterns like uh, an opposite pattern where you have a, a, a reverse a, a upside down uh, cap sized uh, flagpole kind of thing where you, it's the beginning of a bearish trend so this is basically the candlestick and the technical analysis what uh, the stock brokers and uh, people do uh, you if you have seen uh, business reports and stuff you will see you will find that uh, you know this uh, their business report will have uh, this kind of uh, candlestick analysis and uh, you know they will give you a technical report they will give you a fundamental report of uh, what is going on and what what is not is going on so that's basically uh, the uh, technical analysis and then you have quantitative analysis quantitative again, again analysis is again uh, where you look at the prices uh, where, where you study the fundamentals of uh, your your uh, stocks and basically this are this are done using large uh, amount of data and they use computers to find out what the cash flows of that company is what the debts are and what is the relationship with their GDP and stuff and then they they do this quantitative analysis like uh, if this company is a stranded asset or a, a, a you know a very good asset they try to figure out all those things it's very quite similar to fundamental analysis but uh, this is done using computers and stuff where you know they they look into they look into several different various companies and they run it uh, like they have a data database of uh, data mine of uh, 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 balance sheets and profit uh, profit uh, and loss statements and uh, cash flows of uh, different uh, companies where they have invested what 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 companies have invested into them and they run this uh, this quantitative analysis against uh, all these companies and they figure try to figure out like which is the which is the company which uh, which uh, gives you a very good uh, you know which looks as a very good asset to invest on so that's basically quantitative analysis where you are looking into you're comparing the fundamentals of uh, different uh, companies using a computer using a computer program and trying to fi figure out like what uh, what the uh, which which are the stocks where you should invest okay uh, the problems like uh, the technical analysis and these things are pretty uh, like uh, this is uh, basically a pseudoscience. Why we call it pseudoscience? Like because uh, if if you look at the fundamental analysis or the technical analysis or even the quantitative analysis, they do not give you any justification like uh, why 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 they are using this particular thing, right? Like how how does historical uh, happening matters in uh, in in uh, matters in you know predicting stock at the present like uh, when you are analyzing history it's always a exposed position right it's an exposed position like uh, you already know what has happened and uh, what what uh, transfer what has uh, what has taken place in the in the in the history right those are those are those are your historical facts it, it doesn't mean that the same facts are going to repeat again and you will have the same kind of situation and the scenario uh, again in the future and even if you have the same uh, scenario, uh, I mean, it won't be the exact the same scenario. There will be other forces and other factors as well. But let's consider if you have the same scenario again in the future, it doesn't mean that the market is going to behave in the same way in the future, right? I mean, uh, by 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 Austrian theory or uh, by the fundamental axiom, we know that uh, human beings are subjective and uh, we have a subjective scale of value. It doesn't mean that what we whatever tastes were or whatever valuation was of particular thing in the past the same valuation is going to replicate or show up in the future as well uh, so uh, and it's a pseudoscience because uh, you if you if you look at technical analysis i mean you're looking at the statistical tools and uh, how do you know like uh, if uh, if uh, something has gone above the average price that means that uh, you know it is overvalued or undervalued uh, you we do not know all those things right uh, there might be like uh, uh, I mean uh, the, there is no no theory I mean this is what uh, Mises or the Austrians have we have theory or praxeology to interpret what the problem uh, what is what is going on in the stocks and stuff right 
uh, yes this is necessary where you can look into the historical fact and you can find out like uh, what this company has been doing and you can get an idea about the company what what we do is with the historical thing is we research on uh, on what the company's uh, foundation was like uh, how it has performed is it a stable company or was it always fluctuating so these are uh, these are certain kind of things which uh, you know you can make out from uh, from 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 a historical analysis it's not only that but you have to compare using like the you have to find out the history of uh, the economic history of that particular uh, country or that particular company or that sector or what what was going on with the government at that point of time uh, what was was there any stimulus or any program like for example in soviet uh, or socialist countries you have 5 years or 10 years program where you know they give uh, con continuously the bail out certain companies uh, steel companies or they give stimulus to one particular uh, sector so was that happening so we have to look into all those things right so this are the problem is basically they don't have a theory or a fundamental theory where to analyze this uh, problem so, i mean you look at the balance sheet okay uh, of a company uh, it is it is a very profitable company and you invest on the stock so we do not uh, like uh, uh, it doesn't mean that it's going to be a profitable company at the next year as well, right? So it depends on who the board of directors are and how the company is going to do, do and what kind of a company or what kind of goods it is, uh, you know, producing. Uh, so you do not know. So there is uh, there is always that uh, uncertainty in the market, right? And that is what the Austrian approach is. Uh, Austrian approach or Austrian economics has to uh, has uh, talks about. Uh, I mean, there is uncertainty. There is no way of uh, knowing the future. So, so there is no way that uh, you know you can find out like uh, what the future is. You can actually imagine the future. Like you can have certain expectations about the future. Uh, uh, market is based on expectations. Market, uh, the expectation changes in market, and that is the fundamental of uh, the modern Austrian economic theory, uh, where you have to recognize that uh, you, there is no way you can figure out what the future will be, right? But you can always have an expectation, and you can work uh, using expectation. So this is how you you have to, uh, if you are speculating, you have to realize that. Your speculation may be wrong, and that is that is the first uh, fundamental uh, thing about the Austrian approach, where you straight away reject any 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 anyone who says the prices will be so and so tomorrow, and you start believing it's it's kind of an hypothesis, like uh, it's it's a speculation which uh, has come true, uh, and it's not something that uh, this fellow is going to make the prediction. It is going to get it right again and again and time after time, and whatever is is is. You know their predictions are is a gospel. You cannot you cannot uh, go by that kind of an approach in while while investing and trading, right? Uh, problem of mathematical method like uh, the entire method except for fundamental analysis is mathematical. It's it's. I mean you can you surely the a company's uh, business statements, PL statements and stuff uh, are very important and vital. You have to look into what companies you are investing in. And for example, if you're looking at commodities, you have to look at the historical prices of commodities. And the thing with commodities is the commodity prices are pretty stable. They don't crash as much as uh, you know stock stock market crashes. You have very I mean, uh, very few uh, crashes in 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 the commodity market. Uh, one of the fundamental uh, thing about uh, the commodity prices is the commodity prices never falls to zero, right? You don't have uh, copper prices or gold prices. You don't see that it will crash into a, a, a zero amount at one particular day. But unlike uh, the stock market where you have a company and uh, the company, I mean, it might uh, give you wrong books. It might uh, it might give you fraudulent uh, accounting data. They might have manipulated their account books and stuff. So you you do not know, right? These things can take place. I mean, uh, the company, I mean, something might go wrong in the company. The company may not have an insurance and suddenly there is a big fire. In 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 their one of their factories, or let's say it's a, it's a company which is a manufacturing company, and uh, suddenly there was a big accident, and they they many of their workers uh, lost their lives, and they did not have an insurance and stuff, and now they are suing this company. So anything can happen in a stock market, and the stock prices can go zero in in, in one particular day. Uh, so it's 
pretty you know the mathematical method is not going to reveal this kind of uh, things to you like uh, what the government policy will be if uh, if, or if you know you have uh, what what the central bankings are doing so when when we talk about the central banking what we are saying is uh, we the austrians have a concept of uh, the business cycle theory right where how the interest rate manipulation uh, actually changes prices of stocks and stuff so even if you're looking at the APL statement books, you do not know right now if the economy is uh, inflated or was does there a stimulus or the interest rate at what uh, what interest rate they had taken loans and debts and what is their outstanding interest rate, what is going to happen. So the books are not going to reveal those things to you, right, like what the future will be. And that is the problem where we know that in ABCD and what we know by, you know, the stock prices and stuff, what we observe in the financial market is that uh, when, when the market crashes, it's not just uh, the companies which are doing bad, but it's all the companies, uh, most of the companies' stock prices go down. And uh, Even in the commodity market, we, we find that commodity prices do show variance uh, and fluctuations depending on the uh, their either inv the inventory requirement, uh, manufacturing slowdowns, and you know uh, weather changes and stuff. So there is there is changes in the commodity market as well, but uh, not uh, and, and business cycles as well affect the commodity markets. But that's because uh, it it is it is something which uh, ref which is related to the the manufacturing companies or you know the companies or the consumer goods companies where where the, the, the because of the inflationary you inflationary policies of the government uh, that that shows up in the commodity market and uh, uh, you you have a very good uh, correlation in a com commodity market where you can make out like uh, if the dollar is fluctuating what is going to happen if the crude is fluctuating what is going to happen and uh, also a commodity market is a global market it's not a local market. Uh, gold is being traded in every different part of the, you know, uh, in the different part of the world. So there is, is some kind of a price stability, and we, and it's much more, you know, stable than, um, and it, than investing in one particular stock. Uh, but it's not that it's the safest thing to do. You, if we do not know like uh, what what happens in like in commodities, if something goes back in a very in a, in a country for, for example, uh, let's say a country is a biggest or the largest producer of uh, of particular uh, mineral ore or has large deposit of that particular mineral and mine, it has uh, large mines of that particular. Uh, commodity and suddenly there is a government uh, which uh, says that they will they are they are not going to export any of their minerals out of their country. So that's something where the commodity prices are going to show changes, right? Uh, so that's that's the that's one 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 thing which uh, which uh, we have to look into the com commodity markets as well and how the uh, business cycle like where are we standing at the business cycle? Are we at the recession? Period. Uh, is there QEs going on? Uh, what what our central banks are doing? What what will be the future policies of the central bank? What is the inflation level? Are they trying to curb inflation or they are trying to, you know, increase inflations? How many nations are into you know stagflations? What is the political climate over there? Like if there is uncertainty or there is certainty in the market. Uh, war and other other conflicts, philosophical, ideological conflicts, which are going on in the in the in the different parts of the world. So those those affect commodity prices basically. So mal investment is something which uh, the Austrians have. Mal investment is something which uh, we should not uh, be always warn that whenever you are making an investment, uh, you have to look into where where we are standing in the business cycle. Like what which is the which is the part of the business cycle that we are in. And is that business cycle corrected? And uh, are we dealing with bubbles? Is there a bubble, uh, an economic bubble in in the market? So if if you look at real estate or you know in the the IT sector, we know that there is a bubble and uh, how the how the government creates bubbles. And this is this is where you know people do invest because they see an opportunity of uh, you know the prices are going up and uh, they 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 say that uh, they should make uh, hay while the sun shines so they get in get into you know investment of uh, this particular co companies and uh, for example it companies they got a lot of uh, tax breaks stimulus uh, government projects and stuff 
uh, the ID market was changing but these companies were showing profit in their books because uh, of their tax breaks and uh, you know uh, government projects and stuff and suddenly when the government has problem and they started to tax them many of these companies had to get into layoffs and uh, you know they had to uh, they had to put in uh, losses and stuff uh, there was a dot com burst as well and there is another IT bubble which I see in the future coming up uh, I'm an Austrian so I have to be a pessimistic person right so we are always looking for that crash uh, but uh, this is this is what the Austrian approach is uh, where you know how we have to uh, we we have we use methodological individualism so where wherever we are investing we get into this kind of strategies um, mostly the strategies is like uh, know your market where are you standing how the certainty is what are the banking uh, banking central banks going to do what are the interest rates like for example uh, as an Austrian we are waiting for an interest rate to come down right we, we know that uh, the interest rate uh, has to come down I mean they, they have to you know the Central Bank of India has to reduce the interest rate and it's also looking at for foreign investment and stuff so there are regulatory problems and stuff which has to go and then you can see a, a good bull run and that is that is what then Austrian investor would be waiting for right the Austrians need to have a very low time preference unlike a very high time preference where the high time preference is like people who wants to get uh, rich overnight and Austrians have to be very sound and they have to look out uh, for everything and then they will make an investment and then they will speculate so there is a difference of uh, the way the Austrians are going to speculate and the mainstream is going to speculate so that's basically how uh, and, uh, the difference between the mainstream and the Austrian uh, approach of towards investment and this is where the financial markets these are the basics of the financial markets and how they work so that's the end of my session today my presentation and I'm ready for some questions if you have Do you have any questions? Presentation is gone. I think it is there, right? Okay. Cool. what are the indicators of a burst coming we know that there is a bubble but yeah I mean uh, we can never predict we cannot uh, put a date on uh, like uh, we know that the person is going to die right uh, but we we cannot put a date on it so the Austrians is always going to say that uh, you cannot put a date on it you, if there is a burst or if there is a very you know risky scenario then uh, your best opportunity is to wait for that bubble to crash when the bubble crashes is uh, something you depend on uh, on on you have to look into uh, fundamentally like how how the debts are and uh, you know what the inflation levels are and if there is any any forces which is correcting the market like uh, for example if if it depends on how the government is like uh, for example our government what they started doing is uh, they started to look into like there is a uh, as Mises said like there is a a, a time where the, the where the central bank actually cannot inflate anymore and they know that it's going to uh, I would destabilize their rupee the, the the prices it will destabilize and the I mean things are going to go haywire and very, become very unpredictable so they will stop manipulating the interest rates and they will stop infusing new money and this is what we have seen the most uh, central banks are doing at uh, this point of time so there is a phase of correction 
so the uh, so we are waiting like uh, this mal investments have to be liquidated and the correction has to come in the market and uh, things will be reallocated in a proper way so that is that is the uh, indicator or the clarity that we have that we know that uh, you know right now the the correction process is going is is happening in in because uh, the qes and stuff has gone but then if the central bank always keeps on changing things there is no way of uh, you know predicting anything I mean, this is what we see the market goes into sideline or during recessions where you have a very unpredictable thing that we, we do not know what is going to go, go crash and when it is going to crash it's something like uh, one indicator would be that uh, whenever there is a boom everything is going to go up and high till a point where you know, the prices have, have uh, gone two folds or three folds on four folds up and then you will see that there is a, str a struggle of uh, of uh, you know the prices to go further up and that is a point where you should start expecting a crash until and if the if the if if the governments and the central bank keep on doing the same thing there is definitely a bubble which is going to burst at that point of time and that is that is what i have realized from my experience that uh, whenever there is a there is something called as a support and resistance okay in in market so basically their support prices are a price where once the stock the stock or the price falls into that uh, range it uh, it there are suddenly many buyers who comes in to buy that uh, stock and there is a range of resistance where the price moves up the the there are no buyers i mean there are very few buyers willing to buy at that particular range so this is very practical thing right where you have if you if you look at the market and the buyer buyers and sellers value value spread valuation spread of a particular goods we know that uh, they are going to buy at certain prices so once the if you, if if you reach the market there is high inflation and the retail public you know there is a lot of uh, you know uh, price instability like if you are continuously infusing money the prices will be unstable and there you reach a point where the prices uh, are not going up anymore right and that is the point the market is going to correct itself and this we have seen in the stock market as itself right like uh, you will see a trend like it is setting record highs for it will break the first it will start with breaking up a year's record then two years record three years record four years record and then 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 suddenly it will crash so we know that there will be a gap like uh, the the rise is pretty pretty fast uh, and uh, in in that period before a burst and then it collapses suddenly so that's the thing that's how i i i think uh, you can that's an indicator so it comes up with an experience when you are trading or when you are looking in the market uh, you will have an intuition and it's the entrepreneurship spirit i mean the entrepreneur uh, intuition or the entrepreneurship skill and your strategy which uh, which is going to make you profit there are no recipe for success right i mean you have to look at the market and you have to set and judge like where the prices are going you look at certain scripts and you know that what is going on in the market you get a feel of it and that is how you will invest and make money uh, long term investments impossible in this market so we are not looking at any any investment to uh, for 10 or 15 years uh, period uh, those kind of investments can only happen if you know that there is a company, a very stable company, which is going to come up with a product and they have just released an IPO. Uh, very rarely you will get uh, those kind of companies. For example, you're not going to get. Uh, I mean, uh, the, it's not. It's it's very rare to find a Microsoft uh, or a Google at at a very infant state who who stage where they were raising money right uh, from from the stock market. So there there is very very few opportunities of that kind where you can buy the stock of that companies which are at a very nascent stage and will become a very big company in future but there are opportunities so we have to look into the IPO listings and we have to figure out like what kind of business they are and you need to have that entrepreneurs mindset like uh, Warren Buffett's or not and others where you buy these companies uh, stocks and you 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 can make a, I mean you expect them to grow big and you know to, to the, the business owners to make it a very successful company so that's that's the way you should go go in for investment and that is how you should watch out for the market uh, does that answer your question yeah, cool so any more questions <laughs> you're never happy with my answers right <laughs> 
I know, but you don't have a you don't you don't have any 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 you know concrete thing, right? You you cannot predict. I mean, let's say if we had a recipe of prediction, right, where we know that this is what uh, the price tomorrow tomorrow there will be a market fall. If we know what the future is, we are not going to invest in anything. We are going to sell off everything. So that that if that will that is going to take place, right? That is going to happen. So uh, I mean, no. So you can you cannot you cannot have this kind of thing like even in the technical analysis and uh, and like uh, in uh, fundamental analysis the the books is open to everyone right everyone knows what the uh, what the profit and loss statement is how much is the profit let's say my company made a profit of a million everyone knows that I've made a profit of a million and everyone knows my plan that I'm going to come out with a new project so it's the it's the market how they expect me to do and how what what their valuation is that is going to set my future prices so this is never revealed right I mean Hayek, Hayek is uh, Hayek's uh, knowledge problem this well scale of values is not revealed to everyone in the market excuse me So yeah, the scale of values is not revealed, and that is why you cannot have a clear prediction like what is going to happen in the future. <clears throat> so, any more questions, sir? Cool. So, uh, I think I will call it a day. Then, thank you for joining me. Thank you very much. I hope uh, you all enjoyed the session and see you next time. Uh, I'm not sure if we are going to have uh, anything till uh, the month of January, uh, but I will let you know if there is something I can do on the 28th, we will have a session. Thank you for joining me, Joel, Shivang, Shikhar and Shashank. Have a nice time. Good night.